the book of Acts, chapter 21 this evening. We are in a long series on Acts, first century faith for the 21st century. Interesting how many of the things that they experience, we experience in, in our lives as well, in our century. I uh, just received through Christian Post about a young man named Ryan Kohler. Uh, Ryan is a pilot with MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, and he has been imprisoned in Mozambique. Uh, the charge against him is that he is consorting with the insurrectionist. Uh, the truth is he's delivering uh, help uh, to, to those in need uh, on both sides of their civil war, and he and two South African volunteers have been in prison for three months. And so if you'd uh, join me as we pray for Ryan as well, uh, thinking of what the Apostle Paul is going to go through here in the book of Acts. And so Jesus said that we would be persecuted. Jesus said we'd be in prison and some would lose their, their lives. And we find in the book of Hebrews, we're to remember them that are in bonds and to be able to pray for them. And so it's not just something that happened in history or church history, it happens today. And so we wanna pray uh, for those who go through such difficult times. Acts 21, when was the last time you were misunderstood? I mean, you said one thing, but, but people uh, who heard you thought you said something else. That ever happened to you? Well, be a preacher or a teacher, it will happen all the time. Uh, the misunderstanding then be, can become worse, and finally it can get out of control. Rolf, Ralph Waldo, uh, Waldo Emerson said, uh, Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton. Then he said, to be great is to be misunderstood. Uh, now we probably know a lot of people who are mis misunderstood who are not great, uh, but tonight we find someone uh, who is in that company of the list of great people, and he was misunderstood, and it is the Apostle Paul. And so we find him in Acts 21, as you'll see in the map here in a moment. He's returning uh, from his third missionary journey. Uh, it was a successful journey with many people being saved across Greece, all the way down to Corinth, and then retracing his steps. And now he's gonna come all the way back uh, over here to the land of Israel. Would you please stand with me as I read from Acts chapter 21? And the question I pose is, can apostles make mistakes? Can apostles make mistakes? Well, if they can make mistakes, then what about us? So follow with me here in Acts uh, 21, verse one. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a stray course unto Kaz, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patera. Finding a ship sailing over Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed unto Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlaid her burden. Finding the disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went over our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. When we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to uh, Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, uh, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven, one of the seven deacons, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. When he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, his belt, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, this belt, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we, that's, that's Luke saying, uh, because he's the author of the book, we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. 
Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Mnason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. May we pray. Father, tonight we, we come to you and asking you to give an understanding of what's going on in this chapter. I pray that when we face difficult decisions, that from our study tonight that we can learn how you can direct us into the perfect will of God. We know it is your desire that we walk in God's will. It is your desire that we be saved. It's your desire that we surrender and be filled with the Spirit and fight the flesh, die to selfishness and live for you. But God, I pray that as we face difficult decisions that we might seek you first and have your leading and that we would trust in you and find your direction in our lives. So if there be one tonight here or watching online or they're just not sure if heaven's their home, direct them to yourself to be saved. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You know, a major issue every Christian must understand is knowing and doing the will of God. Your joy will be directly related to knowing what God's will is and doing God's will on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, now, God really desires us to discover his will and then to be able to uh, live it out. But there are times when we have to choose between knowing and listening to God's voice or choosing man's advice. And that's what happens here. How do we know the difference? The Apostle Paul had, had determined to go to Jerusalem. However, the road to Jerusalem is paved with many friends and counselors who tell him not to go. Can apostles make mistakes? And if they can make mistakes, then so can we. So what do you do when everybody tells you not to do it? Have you ever been there? Everybody tells you not to do it, and you think, I just need to do this. Well, is Paul infallible? Is it possible for him to step outside the will of God? And if Paul can make a mistake, mistake, well, then certainly we can. If Paul can step outside the will of God, then we can. Is that what happened here? Acts 21 has been used by some to say that Paul is out of the will of God, that he disobeyed God by going to Jerusalem. So let's see what's going on. First question is, should I go to Jerusalem or not? And so we have Paul's choice. We've already seen that. He made the choice. Look with me back at page chapter 20 and verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And so remember Paul, he didn't go to Ephesus because there's so many people say there's such a big church and many little churches. So he asked the pastors to come down to the port city of Miletus and he met with them there. I call it the uh, first spiritual leadership conference so he could continue on his way to get to Jerusalem. He was convinced he should go to Jerusalem. Why was he so bent on going to Jerusalem? He is going to go to Jerusalem no matter what. He is going to deliver some money that had been collected to give to the Christians in need who were there. And his choice to go to Jerusalem is either a bad mistake, as others are saying, or it is proof of his courage and his devotion to God. And so we see the advice of others is, don't go. Now, who warned Paul against going to Jerusalem? Notice, first of all, Acts 21 and verse 4. Finding disciples, they were at Tyre, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And so for seven days, the Christian in this seaport town told Paul, don't you set foot in Jerusalem. Now this is Paul's first contact with these believers. It is likely that his persecution 
of the Jerusalem church back there during the days of Stephen in Acts chapter 11 resulted in the starting of this church. Interesting, because Saul of Tarsus, as a lost man, persecutes the Jerusalem church, what do they do? The Bible says in Acts 8 that they fled everywhere preaching the word of God. Some of those disciples come all the way up here to this uh, northern town uh, on the seacoast, and this church is started. Notice after one week in Tyre, Paul and his party, uh, they leave, but it's touching to see how quickly the believers uh, fell in love with the apostle Paul, even though it's only been a week. So notice in, in verse four, uh, they said to Paul that you shouldn't go up. We care for you. We don't want this uh, to happen to you. Through the spirit, he should not go up. Can the spirit contradict himself? And the answer, of course, is, is not. Now we come to Agabus, verse 7 to 11. Uh, Agabus is a prophet. Uh, Paul meets Philip here. And so in verse 7, when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and abode there. On the next day, we were of uh, Paul's company, departed, came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Hmm. Do you remember Stephen? Stephen is called the first what? He's the first, he's one of the first deacons, but he's also the first, the first martyr. Uh, and his name means crown. He is the first martyr of the church. Who is responsible for Stephen's death? Saul of Tarsus. Who was a close friend of Stephen? It would be Philip. It would be Philip. They were, they were a co-deacons together. They, as our theme goes, they loved together, they grew together, they served together, and then it stopped. Why? Because of Saul. Because of Saul, he thought he was serving God, he persecuted the church, and it led to the death of Stephen. Paul is responsible for Stephen's death. Must have been an interesting meeting for Philip and Paul to be able to get together. Now, 15 years earlier, Paul and Agabus, that happened 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, Paul and Agabus had worked together in a famine relief program for the Judean believers. And here, Agabus, he takes, he takes Paul's belt, he takes it off, and as prophets were known to do, uh, using drama, there's nothing wrong with drama because we find it all throughout the Old Testament. We find baptism is a drama, the Lord's Supper is a drama, and he takes Paul's belt and he binds his feet and his hands together got their attention and then he gives this message and the message is whoever owns this belt is going to be arrested by the Jews in Jerusalem so you have the the disciples at Tyre don't go. You have Agabus who's saying, if you go to Jerusalem, you're gonna be bound. But notice in verse 12, now you have Luke joining with his, his uh, band of, of co-laborers. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, do not go to Jerusalem. And you see again, when you find the, the, the uh, pronoun they, uh, is changed to we, you know that Dr. Luke, the writer, is, is uh, one of the traveling companions. So you got Philip, you got the four uh, daughters, the prophetesses, and you got Agabus saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Now again, the New Testament had not yet been complete, and that's why God allowed the daughters to be able to uh, share God's message. Uh, the, there is, uh, once the New Testament's complete, uh, that office ceased. So we see at this point that all of Paul's advice, all of the counsel of everyone is do not go to Jerusalem. In fact, it says twice that the Spirit said to Paul through these people, you should not go. What would you do? Would you go or would you not go? And so that brings us to a broader question is how to determine the will of God when you have these conflicting messages? There are four major road signs, and I know most of you are familiar with them, uh, but let's review them quickly. First of all, it's the Bible. The Bible reveals God's moral, wall, uh, moral will to us. It's general, but it's true. And so if God gives a command, we are to follow that command. We're always to follow God's command. It's always right to follow God's clear commands. 
You say, okay, well, we got the Bible. Uh, they, they didn't have it yet. They had the Old Testament, not the New Testament. But we have decisions to make that our Bible doesn't explain. So then we come to the second uh, way to determine God's will, and that's prayer. Through prayer, we pray to God, and God responds, and God responds by opening doors, God responds by closing doors, God responds by giving peace and confirmation, or God responds by not giving peace. There's a third, there's a third major road sign to determine God's will, and that is spiritually mature counsel. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Wise counselors. If you're just looking for people to agree with you and your predetermined decision, then you're really not looking for counsel. Uh, you're looking for someone to agree with you and make you feel good about making a poor decision. It's, it's like that guy who, who said, okay, God, I have this decision to make, and I'm, I'm going to go to this uh, particular stoplight, and if the light is green, then I'll know the answer is a yes. And if the light is red, I'll know the answer is no. He's telling his friend. He said, well, what'd you do? He said, uh, uh, the light was green. It took me four times to go around the block to get the green light, but uh, <laughs> I finally got the answer that I wanted. So if that's how you're seeking counsel, then you've already made up your mind. Circumstances is the fourth major way to know God's will. Go to the word of God. You pray, get wise counsel. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. But then uh, God makes a way or he blocks the way. Where God guides, God provides. Uh, God in his sovereignty opens and closes doors. We had a missionary many years ago in the early 90s, and, and as a 12-year-old, he uh, surrendered to be able to go to South America. He had a mission field all picked out, and so all through his teen years, all through his college years, he had this country picked out. Uh, then he was married. He did his internship at his home church, Palmetto Avenue Baptist Church there in, in Florida, outside Orlando. And then he goes on deputation, and he raises the funds. In that process of time, he had several children. And then one of his, ch uh, one of his children, his daughter had a severe medical issue, and, and she was in a wheelchair. And so when he applied for his visa after a good good 15 years of having this plan and the country said no you cannot come learning Spanish and all this what did God do God opened up a door for him to go to Puerto Rico <laughs> so he went there instead uh, we had a missionary who was in the Philippines and they had a child and and the child was was albino and could not be exposed to the sun and the doctor said, you're going to have to live in a place that, that, that where you can have so much sun exposure. What did God do? God allowed him to go to Ireland. Guess what doesn't happen a lot in Ireland? <laughs> Sunshine, a lot of rain, a lot of clouds. Uh, so God sovereignly uh, can move and, and change our path. And that's where surrender comes in. So now we ask the question, uh, did Paul make the right choice and I believe the answer is yes. Paul made the right choice. Can an apostle make a mistake? Yes, he can. They can make a mistake. <laughs> we find that, that Peter, as an apostle, made a mistake. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, the mistake is revealed because the apostle Paul, the Bible says in, in the, uh, writing the letter, Galatians 2, 11, he said, I withstood Peter to his face. Why? Uh, because uh, he was mistaken. He made a mistake. What was Peter's mistake? Well, Peter's having uh, church Sunday lunch, and he's having lunch with some Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. And there's a group that comes along and says, you can't do that. You're breaking Mosaic law. You're breaking Old Testament law. You should not eat with those unclean Gentiles. You remember what God said in the vision of the, of the sheet? Uh, Peter, Peter, uh, what, what I say is unclean, what I say is clean, do not thou call common or unclean. And God did it three times to get Peter this message. What happened? Peter was pressured by these people, and he withdrew from them. And now these Gentile Christians are like, what? An apostle won't eat lunch with us? And so when 
Paul shows up, he confronts Peter. Peter had made a mistake and it had to be made right. But here, Paul did not make a mistake. Let me give you the reasons why I believe that. First of all, his confidence was in the will of God. Look with me in verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? I am, I am ready not to be bound only. I'm, I'm willing and ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You talk about confidence and assurance that this is God's will. Uh, the, the, the promise that Jesus gave uh, Paul at his salvation confirms this. Hold your finger here and turn back to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, when Saul was first saved, <coughs> the Lord Jesus appears to him after his salvation, after he received his sight back. Acts 9, verse 15. The Lord said to him, you've got a red letter edition, you see it in red, don't you? Uh, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, this is the message to Ananias, which then was given to, to uh, Paul. He is going to testify before Gentiles. Okay, he's done that. He's going to testify before kings. That has not happened yet. If that hasn't happened yet, that means he can't die in Jerusalem until he preaches to kings. Second reason is he was diligently seeking to walk in the will of God. Uh, don't you love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Okay, so we have, we have three responsibilities to trust and lean and acknowledge. And what does God do? He shall what? Direct thy path. When you seek God, he will sovereignly step in. The steps of a good man and a good woman are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. I've seen that happen. I've seen we're bent on doing something and we want to do it God's way and we think this is God's way and God has a better way and so he redirects it. Uh, for those who are new and you haven't heard the story, but three times this church family voted to buy property unanimously. Three times the sovereign God of the universe stepped in and stopped the, the, uh, uh, the transaction from happening. And the fourth time is this property you're on right now. Were we out of God's will? No. God says, you're getting closer. You're getting closer. Keep trying. Get closer. And then he opened up this property for us. Two folks I met today came for the first time. How do you hear about our church family? Well, I was driving by. I was driving by and I saw the church. So God used this property to bring people to church even today, and that literally has happened hundreds and hundreds of times. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man, a good woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Paul is walking by faith. One more, uh, uh, that, that his, motive, his motive was pure. He wasn't going to Jerusalem for pride, but as a servant to deliver money to the saints. And then secondly, his care for the believers. I've already mentioned that he wanted to bring money to the saints, but he also wanted to mend this growing division between the Judaizers and the Gentile believers. The Judaizers were these Jewish Christians that sought to steal away Paul's disciples, the faction in the, in the church who believed that you must keep Mosaic law in order to become a Christian, so some of them weren't even saved. And Paul also had, had persecuted the church and, and when he be, before he became a Christian, and now I think he's feeling partly responsible. I, I, I want to help these people out. I hurt them. I want to help them. And so he wanted to go to Jerusalem in himself. And thirdly, there you see the consequences that followed uh, his confirmation, that confirmed his choice. Paul did appear before kings and rulers. As a result of going to Jerusalem, he is going to testify before King Agrippa. He is going to probably appear before Nero. Uh, we know that he made it all the way to Caesar's household in Rome. Paul writes in Philippians 1.12, he said, the things which happened to me in Jerusalem have happened to further the gospel. Philippians 1.12. Okay, so what about these, these conflicting verses like verse four? Through the Spirit, he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Is the Spirit giving conflicting messages? And the answer is no. The Holy Spirit is giving warnings. 
the Holy Spirit is saying, get ready, rather than prohibiting, saying you must not go. Agabus, the prophet, did not forbid Paul to go to Jerusalem. He only told him, if you do go, this is what you can expect, to be arrested, to be imprisoned. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He is saying that Paul is not to go up to Jerusalem unless he is prepared to make the required sacrifice. And Paul is saying, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to offer myself uh, as a sacrifice to the Lord. He is perfectly, perfectly willing to lay down his life for Christ. Uh, we see this in chapter uh, 20, verse 24. He, he said it to the folks there, my leaders. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Chapter 21, verse 13, uh, Paul says, I'm ready to die at Jerusalem if need be. So what happens? They go to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 14 to 17 now when we think of going up we think of going north for them Jerusalem is up high so wherever you are in Israel if you're in Jerusalem you're going down it doesn't matter if it's north or south and wherever you're located if you go to Jerusalem you're always going up so he's now going to go uh, go up to Jerusalem he wants to make it in time for the feast it's a journey of 65 miles that took three days on foot uh, the city would be crowded with pilgrims and Paul ha and his party planned to stay with Manasin, an older disciple given to hospitality. So what are some lessons that we can learn? Here we go. Some lessons that we can learn from this passage about learning God's will. Letter A, we need to seek counsel from God himself first. We need to be in our Bibles, reading our Bibles ourselves. We need to be praying to God and seeking what God would have for us to do first. And so we seek God and we seek his peace. You say, okay, I've done that. I still don't know what to do. All right, then if you seek advice, be discerning. Go to Christian family. Go to Christian friends that you respect, that you know are walking with God. Go in a timely fashion. Go before you've already made up your mind and made your decision. Christians have no business seeking counsel from those who do not base their decisions on the word of God. Secular psychiatrists and psychologists, they are no help, no help to you. You say, I got a marriage issue, you go to them, they'll tell you, get a divorce. Uh, you, you have other issues, they will lead you like the blind men in the dark room looking for the black cat in the corner that's not there. All right, just don't do it. Don't do it. Seek godly counsel. Be discerning of who you ask advice for. And again, uh, just don't go looking to ask advice until someone will agree with the decision you've already made. Let her see, if you give advice, if you're on the other side of this equation, be wise. If someone comes to you for advice, learn to listen much. Talk little. Force yourself into the other person's situation and try to look at things from God's perspectives. Then give counsel based off the principles of the word of God from the Bible. Be cautious, be objective, be sensitive. Seek to give counsel that is based on the word of God. And if you don't know, just say so. And then one more. If you decide against the advice of seeking advice of others, be careful. If you seek the counsel of another person who you respect, you still may find God, God impressing upon your heart, God speaking to your heart, being much louder than those advising you. God often uses other people to speak and confirm his messages to us, but people are not infallible. If the counsel of men and the counsel of women is not completely sound biblically, or if God's leading upon your life is, is stronger, always follow God. Always follow God and ask him to direct your steps. Tonight, are you following God? You following God's word, God's promptings, God leading. Uh, do you tend to ask people first or do you tend to ask God first? So let's make it a daily practice to ask him for wisdom in making our decisions. I love Psalm 19 that gives 
uh, such uh, praise to God uh, through creation, through the scriptures, through the saint. And then he ends it with, uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, be acceptable to you, God, my, my God, my strength, my redeemer. May it be that, that we just want to please God more than anyone else. And whatever consequence happens, that's okay. Let's follow God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the apostle Paul sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are lost and blind to spiritual truth. And I pray, God, that even tonight, again, if there's anybody here, anyone watching online, and they're just not sure if heaven's their home, I ask for the Spirit of God to do the work of convicting, the work of drawing. Lord, people have, have come, people have, have tuned in uh, because they want to hear from heaven. And may the message they hear is that you love them. Jesus died for them and rose again. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we come into God's presence. Tonight, if you're not sure that heaven's your home and you'd like to be saved, you'd like to get it settled, I would be delighted to lead you in that salvation prayer, that commitment to Christ to be born again. Anyone here tonight, you'd say, Pastor, I, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ as my Savior. Would you simply slip your hand up for a moment? Anyone at all, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ as my Savior. Christian, will you make it your priority to seek God, to surrender to God, to follow God's will, God's promptings, God's word? During this invitation hymn, would you, would you just express to God the desire of your heart? Lord, I want to trust in you with all my heart. Lord, I don't want to lean unto mine own understanding. Lord, I want to acknowledge you in all my ways. Father, I want you to direct my path. I ask for your peace. I ask for godly counsel. I ask for a commitment, a determination to desire to do right and to please you more than my flesh, more than family, more than friends, to follow God with all my heart, all my days. Father, thank you. You have not left us alone to guide us through this world until we see you face to face. God, help us to take the word of God. Open the pages. Your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. So God, help us to turn on our spiritual flashlight and follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.